Religious blogger Alice McKenzie says she especially loves the angel in Matthew's version of the resurrection. I agree. Matthew's resurrection angel beats the, those in the other gospels hands down. On one extreme, you have Mark's gospel, describing not an angel at all, but simply a young man hanging out in an empty tomb with the stone that had been in front of the entrance already rolled back. He gives Mary Magdalene and the other women some instructions, and they flee from the tomb in terror, and Mark's gospel ends shortly thereafter. The reader in me is disappointed with such an anticlimactic, almost boring ending. On the other extreme, we have the resurrection according to the Gospel of John. Mary Magdalene peeks inside the tomb and discovers two heavenly beings worshipfully sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. At the sight of them, Mary appears to be close to having a Betty Davis meltdown, and these two other world creatures, instead of giving her comfort or explanation, only turn to her and say without expression or emotion, Woman, why are you weeping? I don't know about you, but this Easter story sounds almost creepy to me. But Matthew's version of the resurrection is my favorite. Matthew describes only one angel. But as Alice McKenzie says, this is an angel who knows how to make an entrance. He comes in with a flourish, descending from the clouds with the cosmic drum roll of an earthquake. And he's a buff angel, strong enough to roll back the large sealed stone. And best of all, He's an angel with an attitude. After he rolls back the stone, he perches on it as if enjoying the mischief he has just created, all the while ignoring the guards who are displaying certain physical symptoms of extreme terror we won't go into. And I imagine him rolling his eyes as if to say, take that Caiaphas, take that Pilot." That's what God thinks of your effort to put the Messiah in a tomb. A tomb as a prison for the Prince of Peace? <coughs> think again. A tomb for his final resting place? I don't think so. And then for his main message, he turns his bright angelic eyes toward Mary Magdalene and the other Mary, and he tells them three things. Three things I want to look at in our time together today. First, he tells them to not be afraid. Mackenzie reminds us that good news in Matthew's gospel is always preceded by one short preliminary sentence. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid, Zachariah. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear a son and you will name him John. Don't be afraid, Mary. Now you will conceive in your womb and bear a son. Don't be afraid, shepherds. I bring you great news of, of joy that shall be to all people. Don't be afraid, Joseph. Take Mary as your wife. Her baby is conceived by the Holy Spirit. Name him Jesus. He's going to save all people from their sins. And it's something that Jesus was saying all the time, too. When he walked on water, he was quick to comfort the disciples by telling them not to be afraid. To a synagogue leader whose daughter had died, Jesus said, Do not fear, only believe. To those who were worried about persecution, he said, Don't be afraid. The worst they can do is kill you. And that might not even work. And in this morning's story, Mary would run headlong into Jesus after her encounter with the angel, and Jesus would repeat the angel's message of comfort and assurance to not be afraid. There's a message for you, a message you and I need to hear more than any other. 
It's do not be afraid. Fear grips our lives and controls us. Parents live in fear of the phone call from school telling them that their child was just injured and is at the hospital. The son or daughter knows that one day it'll happen, but still fears the day he or she will bury their parent. The patient with a family history of cancer fears the dreaded report of each annual checkup as if it were a death sentence. Politicians and preachers alike use fear as their weapon of choice for controlling the masses. We fear entering new relationships and we fear dying alone. Waves of fear wash over us from every corner of life and threaten to destroy us. And out of the loud noise and chaos of emotions that engulf us, the angel tells us to not be afraid. If there's an Easter message for us to hold on to, it's to not be afraid. Don't be afraid because God's love wins out every time. If we can hold on to the belief that God loves us and there is nothing that life can throw at us which will undo us. Bad things will surely happen because that's just part of what it means to be human. But we can rise above it all just as Jesus did if we can manage to control our fear. And we're able to control our fear only if we keep our eyes on Jesus. But some of us can't even find Jesus in the rubble of our lives, much less keep our eyes on him. That was Mary's dilemma. She couldn't find Jesus and the angel, and the angel pointed out that she was looking in the wrong place if she was looking for him among the tombs. He's not here, the angel said. He's raised from the dead. Don't you believe me? Come and see for yourself. You and I make the same mistakes as Mary. We look for Jesus among the tombs. We look for Jesus on the shelves of libraries and bookstores and feel there is something lacking. We look for him in preachers' sermons, but leave feeling inspired at best and unworthy at worst, but lacking an encounter with Jesus in either case. We look for him in the lives of spiritual heroes and heroines, both past and present, but realize that seeing Jesus through their eyes is not the same as seeing him through our own. The angel pointed out that Mary wouldn't find Jesus in the tombs, but would instead find him out in the world. She was looking in the wrong place. Jesus is alive, not dead. And if he is alive, we won't experience him secondhand through books or sermons or words of other people. If he's alive, then we can encounter him personally in a unique way that is meaningful for us and us alone. And finally, the angel tells Mary that not only should she leave the tombs and graves, but she also needed to leave Jerusalem. She needed to leave the holy city and return to the everyday living of Galilee. Jerusalem was fine for pilgrimages and spiritual renewals, but it was no place to live. If the disciples wanted to see Jesus, the angels told Mary they needed to go back to Galilee. You remember Galilee, don't you? That's where water had been turned into wine at a wedding celebration. And a couple of fish had fed thousands at an impromptu sermon on the grounds. Galilee was where the blind had received sight and lepers had been restored to wholeness. It's where Jesus had said, the last shall be first and the first shall be last. And it's where he had been criticized for mingling with Gentiles and including prostitutes and tax collectors among his circle of friends. Return to Galilee 
and you will find Jesus, the angel said. Re-embrace the familiar ground and the daily routines and rituals of your home and community. You and I return to Galilee when we participate in the everyday stuff of life and when we remember. When we find comfort in the story of Jesus, which we have heard more times than we can recall, we return to Galilee. Every Sunday when we sing or pray or whisper the words of the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples, otherwise known as the Lord's Prayer or the Our Father, we remember his teachings and we find ourselves with the disciples once again in Galilee. Every time we take the bread and the cup and we do this in, the remem in remembrance of the one who redeems our lives, we join the others in Galilee. Every time we gather with a community of people so different than us, but who love us and pray for us and care about us, we remember the commandment to love God and love each other. And we have gone ahead with the others to Galilee. And that's where we find him not in the holy cities of our spiritual pilgrimages, not within the books, pages of books written by saints and theologians, not by imitating the behavior of other people, but in Galilee, in the everyday experiences of life. That's where we will find Jesus. And when we do, then we can finally, once and for all, let go of fear, knowing that God's love for us always wins out. Love conquers all. And that's what I think is the message of Easter. Love wins because Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Alleluia. And amen.